عايز اسكت Good evening and welcome to our January lecture in our Understanding ADHD lecture series. I'm Kathy Essig, a member of the Chad Nova board of um, the no Chad DC Nova board. And I'm pleased that my friend Alex Chip has taken the time from his very busy schedule to present the new digital SAT demystified, what you need to know. Chad of Northern Virginia and DC is one of the many chapters in the Chad National Organization and as such aligns with the national mission of improving the lives of those affected by ADHD. We're a volunteer organization of trained professionals who offer support in a number of ways. In addition to offering this free monthly lecture series on the second Tuesday evening of most months, we also have support groups for parents, students, and adults as well as an annual resource fair to highlight ADHD Awareness Month. While we're all volunteers, we cover other expenses through membership dues, donations, and sponsorship. And we urge you to become a member. As we begin our lecture tonight, please everybody make sure that you're muted and that you've turned your video off while Alex is speaking. Put your um, questions into the chat and we'll get to them at the end. And now it's my honor to introduce Alex Chip, who's the founder and president of Top Score Education. Alex is a nationally recognized expert in the ACT and SAT and has tutored thousands of students in these exams over the past 19 years. After attending Duke University for undergrad and John Hopkins for graduate school, Alex began top score in DC, but now also has branches in Miami and Durham. <clears throat> he has 20 educators working with him to support the students that they're preparing um, for exams and sees clients across four continents. I want to thank Alex for joining us. He really is the voice of wisdom here, and we're excited to understand more about this test. So thank you for joining us, Alex. Thanks so much, Kathy. I really appreciate it. And I'm very excited to be here today to, to talk to everybody. Um, you know, I started my company 20 years ago because I loved working with students and I didn't realize how much I would also love working with the parents. And I know that in the first sort of decade that I was doing this, people would kind of ask me, you know, where do you work? And I would say, oh, at the dining room table, because that's where I would work, in, you know, in, in family homes and sitting with the student at the end often both parents would come and sit down and we would talk about how the student was doing, but also about the test. And I think a lot of the the value and a lot of the relationship building that that happened in those sessions with the families came from questions like the ones I'm going to try to answer today. Uh, and and sort of in my role of of being an advocate, not just for the student, but for the family and helping to, um, you know, provide to, to shine light on, on the darkness. And that's, of course, what, what sort of brings us all anxiety and fear is the unknown devil we don't know. And so um, I, I'm here today to talk about the new digital SAT, which when I first heard about it, you know, a couple of years ago when the SAT said this is what we're doing, was scary for me. So I can imagine that for a parent, you know, with a 16, 17 year old, how scary it can be to not know the details of this and what it means for your family. And so I'm hoping that I can ease that anxiety a little bit today, answer some questions broad and specific, um, and uh, yeah, shine a little light on that darkness. And so we are, you know, as a company, uh, and uh, when you approach any kind of a standardized test or education in general, you know, to me, you always need three things. You need a mastery of the content. You need a plan of attack, and you need to be an interesting person that your student is gonna connect with. And that sort of guided us in our staffing and, and our programming from since you know 2004 when I started the company and and that's sort of how we approach it. We find uh, tutors who are outstanding at their content and we interview them you know uh, for quite a few times to make sure that they are incredibly passionate and interesting and someone that we would want to spend 24 hours with if we were you know a 17 year old and then we teach them the programming and a lot of that programming came from my early years, so many of which were spent working with students who had learning differences. Uh, and whether it was study skills for school or the SAT or ACT, a lot of my early years of learning, uh, you know, how to do what I do today was built on helping students with learning differences to organize their thoughts, to organize the problem that they were trying to solve. 
Uh, and that's a lot of what we do in our programming across different subjects and tests. It's saying, what are the problems in front of us and how do we take step one and how do we break it down? And I think that's been hugely vital to our success, both with students who are neurotypical and neurodiverse. So um, that's sort of guided in us and, and who we are and, uh, and what sort of brought me here today to talk with you guys about the digital SAT. So in today's presentation, we're going to begin talking a little bit more broadly about the SAT and ACT. And you'll see me touch on the ACT quite a bit today, uh, though the, the presentation today is based on the digital SAT and the changes with that exam, because understanding the SAT requires understanding the context of the decision that all students are really going to be making about where do, you know, where do I want to spend my preparation time, which test is a better fit for my skill set. So you'll see me talk about both of them today. Um, but of course, we'll, we'll, we'll lean a little bit more towards that digital SAT to talk about the changes there. I'm going to talk about the timeline of when a student might want to prepare for these exams and when they might want to take their first exam. Um, certainly talk about the SAT for, versus the ACT and, and which one is a better fit for which kind of student, the accommodations that are available for those students, uh, and, and certainly some tips for how to prepare for these exams for students, um, especially ones who are neurodiverse and what are some specific things that I focus on more with those students in preparation um, so that, you know, you all as parents, as you, you know, even interviewing, you know, whether it's you helping your student out, you helping your student to help themselves, or, you know, maybe interviewing a tutor and asking, you know, do you address these things with my kid? And then finally, at the end, uh, I look forward to the, to the question and answer. Um, you know, a lot of times I say devils in the details. But the SAT scare off, so let's not call it the devil. And let's let's say the majestic is in the minutia. And so please, questions broad or specific, put them in the chat. And at the end of today's uh, discussion, um, my executive director Brian is going to be will sort of uh, reorganize those questions and give us the broadest ones first that will pertain to almost everybody on the chat. And then we'll get more and more specific with those questions. And I'll make sure I try to answer everybody's question by the end of the day. So giving you a bit of an overview here, the ACT and the SAT, these are tests that still are primarily taken by juniors and seniors at the beginning of senior year. Um, the test is gonna be about two hours and 15 minutes in the digital SAT uh, at about three hours and 15, three hours, 20 minutes for the ACT. So the ACT is about an hour longer. That's one of the big changes that's been made with the new digital SAT. And we'll talk about that in detail today. Um, the digital SAT debuts in the USA in March, I say USA because it's been uh, uh, administered internationally since last March, since March, 2023. But so this is a big date coming up in March is the debut of the new digital SAT. The ACT remains unchanged, primarily given in pencil and paper. I say primarily because the ACT did just start offering an option for students to take the test digitally. However, this is a little different than the new digital SAT situation. The ACT digital option is simply basically a, almost a PDF version of the paper ACT. So the two tests are identical. It's just a matter of filling in bubbles on paper and selecting bubbles on a computer. So that almost all of our students who are taking the ACT will continue to do pencil and paper, uh, whereas the SAT is now only offered digitally. All schools, all colleges and universities accept both the ACT and SAT, and there's really no bias for one or the other. So you don't have to worry about that saying, oh, if I'm a New England school, do they prefer the SAT? It's not like that. Uh, it's whatever, whatever test your student is going to score better in comparatively is the one they're going to want to take. You don't have to consider which colleges they're applying to when making that decision. As far as registering for the exams, um, the links are collegeboard.org and actstudent.org to you create a profile for your student, sign up for an exam, and um, you want to generally sign up for an exam pretty far in advance. Um, for the SAT, with the new digital SAT, spots will probably fill up quite quickly, um, as a lot of parents will just sign up, even if they're unsure their kids will take the test, but they just want to make sure they have a spot. So you want to be ahead of the game in, in terms of that, and for the ACT, a little bit more about test location. The earlier that you register for a test, the more likely that a location near your home will be available. So registering early is usually a good idea. Um, by early, I mean, you know, maybe six months before the exam you want to take. So if, if your student is a current sophomore and you know they're going to want to take, let's say, the December 
ACT next year, maybe at towards the end of summer, try to register them for that test. Uh, as far as how many times you should take the exam, um, students should, should do some testing to diagnostic testing and figure out the better test for their skill set, either the SAT or the ACT, and focus on that exam and take that test two to three times over about a four to six month period. Some students will take it once and some students will take it four times, but generally speaking, you want to take it two or three times and a good sort of overall time frame to think about for both your preparation and your test attempts is about four to six months. Um, that time period and taking the test a few times, uh, it benefits, you benefit from the experience of taking the test and you benefit from super scoring if you take the test multiple times. And I'm going to talk about super scoring right now. So with super scoring, what this means is that if you take the, let's say, digital SAT, let's say you take it in March and then again in June as a student, what will happen is you'll take the test twice. Uh, the test is out of 1600. You get an 800 for your uh, verbal score, which you know is also called your evidence-based reading and writing score, EBRW. That's your verbal score out of 800. And you get a math score out of 800 for a total out of 1,600. So here's an example of a student from 2021. And this was the paper SAT, but the scoring will be the same. So um, this student in March of 2021 got a 640 on their verbal, 720 on their math. And you see they got a 1360 total. So they decided to go ahead and, and take the test again in May. And you can see their verbal score went up 40 points and their math score came down and their, their total score 1340 was disappointingly lower than their March score. However, when they applied to colleges, you can see in their yellow super score row that they're able to submit the higher of the two verbal scores, the 680 with the higher of the two math scores, 720, for what is called your super score of 1400. And so, of course, that, you know, is going to benefit students who take the test two or three times because they don't have to be better in all aspects of their game on a certain day. As long as they were better on one half of the test than they had been in the past, they're going to benefit overall from that performance. And so that's what super scoring is. It works the same way for the ACT across the four ACT subjects. Um, and, and that in, in the ACT, super scoring is almost even more powerful because you only have to do better in one of the four subjects and your overall super score is going to go up and benefit from that day. Um, as far as schools that uh, will accept super scoring, most schools do for the SAT. Almost all schools do for the SAT. Um, not as many for the ACT. It's a little bit more like maybe 60 percent of schools except uh, super scoring for the ACT, 60 to 70%. Um, but uh, when you're applying to 10 schools, you know, that means that probably nine or so will super score your SAT and a good six or seven will super score an ACT. So super scoring is an important part of your test taking strategy. Now, as far as taking the test six times, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, you know, your scores are just not likely to go up. You're adding undue stress to yourself as a student. You want to take the test when you've done at least some preparation that gives you probability of improving your scores and has put you in a mindset where you're likely to improve at least one subject um, in your scores. As far as the preparation timeline and when to take the tests, um, this is where the answer is very much it depends. So I want to give you a sense of what the options are there and what some general schedules are. Uh, traditionally, Students, you know, then back in my day in 1999 when I was taking the SATs, uh, you know, we took them in the spring of junior year uh, and then in the early fall of senior year, kind of preparing over the summer and taking it in, you know, maybe October of senior year as a second test attempt. But now the tests are offered year round. Um, there's an ACT or S18 every month but January. So you really have a lot of options for when you want to do your preparation. Uh, when it comes to like when you can take the test, as far as when you should take the test as a student, uh, it really depends mainly on two things, curriculum and the time you have available to prepare. Um, curriculum is the is the less important of the two factors. It's a little counterintuitive. You'd think, oh, well, doesn't the curriculum and the content matter so much for when you take the exam? But it doesn't. These tests, you know, you have school exams that are testing you on really what you've learned in class as a junior, let's say. These tests are a little bit more on how have you learned to think mathematically from fifth 
through 11th grade and in your English courses from fifth through 11th grade? How have you learned to think versus the precise material from your textbook? So that's why the curriculum considerations are a little bit muted here, but there, there are some. Um, the math is the most important curriculum consideration when you're looking at when you should take your tests. The SAT tests through Algebra 2. So ideally, in a perfect world, you'll take the SAT near the end of when you've learned Algebra 2 or after you've completed Algebra 2. The ACT goes one year further in terms of math content tested. It takes into account pre-calculus. So again, ideally, if you're taking the ACT and you can take it you know, at near the end of your pre-calculus course or after you've completed pre-calculus, that's great because it means that you'll have encountered all the material you could possibly see on the exam. Uh, now, again, I say ideally because uh, some students want to take the ACT. It's better for them schedule-wise to take it long before they've completed pre-calculus as a course in school. And when you actually look at the impact of that, pre-calculus on the ACT, it's around 15 to 20% of the math questions. And that makes up about 5% of the overall score. So, you know, 120th of your exam is impacted with by the fact that you have or haven't finished pre-calculus. So in the grand scheme, that is not a huge impact. Whereas what I'm talking about next, your time considerations, I think is gonna have a much larger impact than on 5% of the test. So the time considerations here, I think are the most important factor of when you test. And it's all about when your student has the time and the motivation to prepare and take that exam. So think of test prep as a four to six month time commitment. And that's whether they're doing it with a tutor in a class or independently on their own. Um, you know, think of it as a four to six month varsity sport. It shouldn't be quite that time consuming, but if you give it that level of sort of time mentally, uh, you know, it might take up 70, 60 percent of what that time would actually be. But it's not a bad way to kind of frame it in your mind and in your student's mind. Um, now, to give you a sense of, of what I mean by, you know, when you have time and motivation to do so, the factors I'm talking about are sports after school, debate after school, choir or cheer, uh, if you're in a robotics uh, team after school and anything, especially that's seasonal, uh, you have to think about. And so if your student has a varsity sport and is in the spring play, that is not a good time to do preparation for these exams. If they do fall and spring sports or fall and spring musicals, but the winter is open, that might be a great time to prepare for the exam. So I'm going to give you here four examples, two from each test with kind of sample timelines of when you can begin and when you can test. And I'm gonna go from kind of early to late. So example number one would be an example of a student who's starting pretty early in the game. So a student might start their SAT test prep in the June after sophomore year, before junior year, right after sophomore year ends, they say, all right, I wanna take advantage of this summer. I'm gonna start preparing for the SAT. They study all summer. They take the test in August, they keep studying, will get a few months of school under their belt and they retake in November and hope that that's it, that they're done with that early November SAT exam. And so that June to November time frame would be one of these four to six month periods that we could consider. Example number two is a student who says, you know, no, that summer I'm going to be doing an internship. I want to also get a few months of pre-calculus under my belt. So I'm going to start my ACT prep in November and do kind of a winter program, study over the winter, get some extra studying in, uh, you know, in, in Florida over the uh, winter holiday, and then I'm going to test in February the first time, keep studying and learning pre-calculus in school, and test in April as a second test attempt. Example number three, a student starts in January of junior year and tests in March and June at the end of junior year. And finally, an example number four might be a student who has a super busy uh, junior year, or maybe they're just not ready mentally to commit to any kind of preparation early on in junior year. They say, you know what, I'm going to take advantage of my summer after junior year and really buckle down and do my preparation and testing then. And they might start towards the end of junior year in May, but really focus their effort in that summer after junior year. All four of these are perfectly fine ways of approaching the exam. It just really depends on the student.
getting to the digital SAT, which is, you know, obviously the title of this presentation. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details on this slide. I don't think it's that important for you as parents to know the exact number of minutes in each two. But understanding the format of the test and how it's changed is uh, maybe more interesting than important, you know, but um, so you're you can talk about with your student. Uh, I think it's understanding why they changed to a digital exam. And one of the very big reasons was so that they could make it an adaptive test. Um, what an adaptive test here means is that when you go in to take the SAT, the digital SAT in March, you sit down as a student. Your first section is going to be a verbal section. That's reading and writing. You're going to have the same section, the same uh, questions as everybody in the nation. Everybody in the country is going to take that same first section. The questions, okay, in that section are going to be the same for everybody. Uh, what's going to happen then is that after you finish that first section, every student's going to get a new reading and writing section, but that reading and writing section will be either easier or harder, one of two different kind of door number one, door number two, based on how they performed in that first section. So it's the software does a real-time evaluation of the student's skills from the first section performance. And then that student, if they did poorly, they're going to get the easier module. If they did quite well, they're going to get the harder module. And of course, the harder module uh, is going to open up the path to higher. If they struggled in the first section, got more questions wrong, they're going to get an easier module and their ceiling is going to cap out at, at a lower score. They're not going to be able to score as high as the students who went onto the harder module. The exact same thing happens in math. Everybody then gets a math section and that everybody in the country gets the same first math module. And then the second module, the second section will be easier or harder um, based on how the student performed in the first section. The reason for all of this is that um, is that the SAT and, and test makers in general believe that you're going to do you're gonna that that you're gonna have a better uh, a better analytical score if your scores are compared against students within your ability level. So a student who's going to MIT for math versus a student who is considering maybe going to community college, maybe not going to college at all those two students probably shouldn't be taking the same 50 math questions. What they've learned in school is gonna be at such vastly different levels. You're not learning enough about either kid by having them take the same exact 50 questions. So this allows the SAT to create peer groups a little bit better. Uh, and that's how they've been able to, how in their words, they're able to get the same level of understanding of a student's score in a two hour and 15 minute test versus a three hour and 15 minute test because the questions are more geared towards the individual student's skill levels. So that's the reason for the adaptive nature of the test. And that's why the test has, they've been able to, to do a test that they say is the same value, but with fewer questions and therefore less time. As far as the content within the exam, which, and this is the more important part, I think the adaptive part, and there's, there's some deeper stuff in detail I could go into on the adaptive section. And I think it's all very interesting, but it doesn't really impact the way you prepare as a student. This slide and the content changes is more important practically for a student who wants to prepare for the digital SAT. And for a parent who's helping their student determine if they should take the digital SAT or the ACT. The math is now going to be a little less wordy and they've eliminated the non-calculator section that existed on the paper SAT. So the digital SAT, that means that the questions are, they attempted to make them a little bit more straightforward uh, and that you will have a calculator for all of your math questions. Um, so that will help students who are, who use their calculator a lot in school, who are very comfortable using their calculator. And maybe for students who struggle a little bit with word problems, they may prefer this style of math section. On the verbal side, this is a big, big difference that students are really going to feel when they take the SAT is that unlike the old paper SAT and unlike the ACT, the reading passages are going to be only one paragraph long and there will only be one question for each of these paragraphs. Whereas the ACT and the old paper SAT had a you know long five paragraph passage with nine to 11 questions after it. This is going to be important for students, uh, and we'll talk about it in sort of the SAT versus ACT slide, but 
this is something for students to consider and some students will really benefit from this shorter time frame of, of focus and just the shorter the the fewer words that they have to focus on in order to answer a reading comprehension question um, there's going to be a slightly broader range of topics in the verbal including poetry students shouldn't hear the word poetry and run for the hills uh, there's not going to be a ton of poetry on there. They shouldn't have to, they're not going to have to study a bunch of Keats and Wordsworth, I promise. Um, but there is going to be science. There's going to be poetry. There may be a drama passage. Uh, but again, these are, there'll be one question after it. So they don't have to worry about getting some long romantic, pen, you know, stanza poem and having to answer 10 questions about it and feeling sunk. Um, and then a, a bigger change is going to be the greater emphasis on vocabulary and context and transition words in context. Um, transition words meaning like however, nevertheless, regardless, furthermore. So um, the reason I bring up this as an important bullet point is that these two things, vocabulary and transition words, are harder to study and harder to prepare for. So th there are skills that are objective. So for a student, a learning how to use a semicolon is objective. It's based on a few facts that you can memorize, practice, and be prepared for. Vocabulary is not something that clear cut and black and white that you can prepare for because even taking a big box of flashcards is not going to get you there because it's vocabulary in context. So, you know, you they might ask you what self satisfied means in the context of a sentence, and a student may have done a good job with their Latin roots and they see the word satisfied and they say, oh, well, it means happy or content, but self satisfied means smug and conceited. And so that's going to mean something different in the context of a sentence than a student might think from the basic kind of flashcards and, and Greek or Latin roots that they may have studied. So, and transition words, the same thing based on a sentence, you know, however, and nevertheless are very similar contrast transitions, but based on context, they can be used a little bit differently. And a lot of that comes from, you know, let's say the feel of your ear for a sentence. And that's a little bit harder to learn how that impacts us is that the ACT leans more towards things you can learn that are objective in black and white. The SAT is now providing a little bit of a greater emphasis, uh, emphasis on some of these things that you might have to feel or listen for. And so that means that the ACT is a little bit more learnable for hard workers. The SAT is going to be something that's a little bit more intuitive for strong readers who read a lot and have a good feel for language. So these are some differences that are a little bit subtle, but can have uh, impact when you're as a student are choosing which test you wanna pursue. Uh, and then the big change is that there's gonna be more time per question on the digital SAT than the old paper SAT, and also than the ACT. So a student who maybe doesn't have accommodations, but read a little bit slowly, and they need a little bit more time per question, they may appreciate that in the digital SAT. Now this impact a little bit more specific for neurodiverse students and how the digital SAT changes may be positive and negative changes. Uh, and, and this is an important slide for me because on the surface, it all looks positive. Because I talk to one of my neurodiverse students, or they say, oh, a shorter test, I can spend less time in the classroom. I love that. Shorter reading passages, I love that. Less wordy math questions, I love that. So my neurodiverse students, on the surface of it, they hear about the SAT changes and they're like, digital SAT is for me. Um, but, you know, obviously there's a little bit more to it than that. And starting with some of the negatives, that digital SAT, it promotes intuition over analysis. And again, this is around the margins. This is a small factor, but for the reasons I mentioned before about vocabulary and transition words, there's a little bit more intuitive skill that goes into that digital SAT than, than used to be important. And so uh, I, I sort of take that as a negative because it's something that if I have a neurodiverse student who's willing to learn the patterns and willing to, um, to study the content, they're, they're not gonna see that benefit quite as much when they take the digital SAT. Uh, anything that's on a screen is gonna encourage you to show less work. And for my neurodiverse students in all subjects, SAT and ACT and school subjects, I think it's important for them to see their work on the page, to sort of track their progress through a problem solving by showing it in a, a linear style on a page. And that is all discouraged, of course, when you're doing a digital test. There's some scrap paper, but it's hard to kind of be doing that transferring all the time, which is the next bullet point, 
that when you're doing a math question, trying to just the simple act of transferring information you're seeing on the screen into your practice work on scrap paper is something that minority-diverse students um, do have some trouble with that basic transferal versus something that's on the paper that they're doing their notes on the paper where the question is written. So that's something to take into consideration on the digital test. Some positives of the digital test, yes, the passages are shorter and the test overall is shorter. For, so for my students who have endurance problems that I have some students that because of the way that they think it, it they get physically tired earlier in a test than my other students. And this is just a shorter test. Um, some of my students who I reading a five paragraph passage that by the fifth paragraph, those second and third paragraph, that information, there's no retention, it's just gone. Whereas one paragraph, they're plastic. And there are some students that I just have that total black and white duality between one paragraph and five paragraphs. And of course, for those kids, one paragraph read passage is a great change. Uh, and then the less wordy math problems are going to be able to help um, the students who in the past have been great, great at math, but get lost in the of a, of a three-year, four-step word problem. Um, as far as the strategies that are specific to the digital SAT that I'm going to work with students on, um, and this is, of course, for all students, but a special focus for my neurodiverse students is understand and practice those digital tools. With my neurodiverse students, we always spend a little bit more time on the instructions of tests, and that's going to include the tools available when you're taking a test line where you have you know, little highlighting tools and things like that. Whereas on a paper test, there's one tool, it's the pencil. So, you know, it's a little bit easier and faster. This, we're gonna have to incorporate a little bit more digital tool teaching into our program. Um, and then taking intentional steps to avoid transcription errors for the reasons I mentioned before from screen to scrap paper. Uh, and then with adaptive testing, careless errors can hurt you more than in a linear paper test because you make one careless error too many in that first module and then because you go into the weaker second module, it means even if you're great in that second module, you're now you're warmed up and you make no careless errors and you're perfect, you're still capped because you went into the weaker of the two modules. And so careless errors in that first module especially take on a greater importance. And so I'm gonna have to focus with all of my students on being incredibly careful um, in that first module. As far as which test you know, your student should, uh, I'm gonna give you kind of a, a brief overview here, uh, you know, between the ACT and the SD. The A lot of these bullet points here are gonna be based on the fact that the ACT, because it's not a new test and the ACT hasn't changed very much in 20 years, the patterns are very set and preparation and patterns go hand in hand. So students who are willing to work hard and learn the patterns and see those patterns on test day, of course, are going to benefit more from pep preparation. So the ACT is always going to benefit students who are harder workers, the worker bee, you know, versus students who are just good testers. Some students who just get it, they're good testers. I might direct them to the SAT because maybe they don't need as long to learn all those patterns. They can just learn and understand the format of the test and go in and ace it, that smart slacker type. Um, the same thing goes with oration because the ACT is more based on patterns. Uh, if you can organize yourself to learn those patterns, you're gonna learn those patterns, uh, you're gonna learn them better. If you're a little bit disorganized, it's gonna be a little bit harder to memorize those patterns and recognize them on the day of the exam. Um, STEM kids, uh, the ACT has a science section. It's not testing you on really advanced content you learned in AP chemistry or anything like that, but it is science. And so if you speak the language of science, if you understand what an independent versus a deep variable is in an experiment, that science section is gonna be easier for you. So that STEM kid is generally gonna have an advantage on the ACT, whereas the SAT, I mentioned it before, there's some intuitive benefit to students who have read a lot. And so students who read for pleasure and is really strong verbally is going to have advantages over other students AT that aren't as pronounced on the ACT. Um, as far as time, extended time students, and this is going to be very important for a lot of our, our, of our parents who have um, students who have learning differences who are going to have accommodations on the exam. 
if you get extended time on the exam, the ACE is usually going to be the better exam. And the reason is that the ACT is meant to be a hard test pacing wise. The SAT is, as it's constructed, is not to be very challenging pacing wise. So what happens is that one of the things that's hard about taking the ACT, and you as a parent, if you sat down and you took it, you'd say, wow, this ACT, the content is manageable, but boy, that clock goes fast. I didn't have time to finish. The SAT, you'd say, oh, I had no problem finishing this test, but some of the, the wording was pretty difficult. Some of these concepts and passages, passage paragraphs were really difficult and profound. And so the ACT, the clock is a big hurdle. But if you have extended time, the time the ACT provides is quite generous. And so if you get extended time for the ACT, oftentimes that obstacle, the obstacle of finishing the test in the time provided kind of goes away. And so now the obstacle is the content, which as I mentioned is quite black and white and learnable. And so the extended time for the ACT is a big bonus. It's a big advantage. Um, over a student who might read a little slowly but doesn't have any time accommodations. Whereas on the essay, since everybody has quite a bit of time question, um, getting extended time for the SAT doesn't really change the outcome very much because comparatively, it's an advantage over what another student has. So, and as far as pacing, what I mean is the time per question. So you have more seconds per question on the SAT than you do for the ACT. And so you just have more time to read the question and answer it. So when you're looking at the two tests in your time side by side, the SAT feels easier when it comes to the clock. The ACT feels harder when it comes to the clock. Um, but if you had extended time for that ACT, you'd find, oh, this clock now it feels a lot more manageable. And I'm happy to answer more questions about that at the end, because that is an important consideration of taking the ACT versus the SAT. Um, and the final bullet point here about ACT versus SAT, uh, the quizzes every day, please, versus I'll rock the final exam, is that the, the ACT is great for students who are going to be, who are going to be teachable or who are willing to follow a schedule and that they're good at learning the content in sort of these small chunks over time. Because the ACT, there's four subjects, there's a lot of content, so you, you need to be able to break it up. It's not a great test to cram for in a couple of weeks. Whereas the SAT, uh, for a student who's kind of, who procrastinates, who's not really going to come on the program, but they have like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll study really hard for three weeks, mom. That SAT, it's a little bit less content. And like I said, it's a little bit more on the intuitive side, a little bit less based on patterns. So if my son, and he's only seven now, but in 10 years, if my son says, dad, I'm an adult, I'm not going to spend five months preparing for the thing. I'll give you two weeks. I would put him towards the SAT uh, and hope that, you know, that he's good at cramming. And so that that's a little bit of a different term of personality type um, that might lean towards the SAT. Um, you know, test optional. This is also obviously something that's really, and this could of course be its own entire presentation, um, but this is something that's on everybody's mind. It, uh, obviously it became more popular during COVID because it became a necessity. And now it's something that is true of most schools. So we have test required, optional and test blind. Um, we'll go through each of these quickly. Um, test required means just like we're all used to from the old before times of, you know, before COVID where uh, if you were applying to schools, you needed to take the SAT or ACT because almost all of them were going to require you to have an SAT score. That's no longer the case. They're much more in the minority. The number will continue to grow, but it will always, I think, be in the minority of schools that require testing. Georgetown does, MIT does, some of the bigger state schools do, but most private schools especially are going to stay test optional, which means if you have a good test score that you're proud of that fits well within the school's admissions numbers, you're encouraged to send it. If you have trouble with access to the exam or testing bringing an incredible amount of anxiety, uh, but you're strong elsewhere and you wanna submit an application without the test at all, that schools welcome that as well and say that we're gonna give you a real shot in admissions without a test. And then test blind, which is mostly the University of California school system, uh, is they don't want to see your test even if you have a perfect score. They don't think the test is a valid measure and uh, and they don't want it. So that, those are kind of your three buckets. 
as far as who should, you know, who will submit test scores, a strong testers, you're going to want to test. If you're a strong tester as a student, you test and you're going to submit your scores to a lot of your schools. So if your diagnostic test, meaning the first test you take as a sophomore, or early junior year, whether it be a PSAT, act ACT or SAT exam with an outfit like mine, if you get like a 1200 SAT score or a 25 ACT score in one of those tests without preparing, that means you're a strong tester and you should prepare and take the test because you're going to set, you're going to use that test in your admissions process. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, if you go into one of those tests, you haven't prepared, but you give it your best on that day. And I mean, like you really tried, you didn't go in and do some 10 questions and fall asleep, but you gave it your best. Um, and you have a strong GPA, you're a bright kid, you have a good narrative, meaning you have good extracurriculars, et cetera. You don't have to go to a Georgetown or to this specific school. Um, but your diagnostic scores, those first tests are well below the national average of a 1050 for the SAT or a 20 for the ACT. Of course, you can improve scores dramatically. But again, if you have a strong GPA and you're going for pretty selective schools, are you going to raise your 18 ACT score, you know, to a 29 or 30 that would help you get into some of those most selective schools that, you know, that's going to be a lot of work with an uncertain, you know, reward at the end of it. So maybe that student is going to be better off focusing on their school GPA, crushing that, having great extracurriculars and clubs, et cetera, and uh, fantastic college essays. And as far as the rest of us, for everybody who's not clearly an amazing tester and is not somebody who really struggles with tests, but somebody more in the middle, um, it is going to depend, depends on what school you're looking at, how selective they are on your GPA, on how hard your classes are, et cetera. But the most likely outcome is that you're going to, if you take the test, you prepare for it, you improve your scores and, and, and you do well for you you're going to use scores at some schools you apply to, and maybe for, especially for your re school, you probably will withhold your scores and not send them. That's kind of for the middle group. That's the most likely outcome, which means testing is still important. You just might use your test for every school you apply to. Now, just a few quotes from, I mean, I don't know if some of you saw a New York Times article that came out just in the last couple of days, but I think it's a good indication of, of where I think that sort of test optional kind of movement and thought process is going. Um, the president of Brown University gave this quote that uh, standardized test scores are a much better predictor of academic success than high school grades. And all schools will say the most important thing that they look at is your high school GPA. So if the president of Brown University is saying standard test scores are a better predictor of academic success than high school grades, and, and Brown is a test optional school, it sort of says something about what leadership at these selective schools, and not just at Brown, but other schools, um, don't have to be Ivy League schools, but schools still value test scores. If they don't value the test scores, then they're test blind, like the UC system, the University of California school system. So it means even if a school is test optional, if you have test scores that are in the range of the students that they accept, that's something that's going to help you get in. Uh, I think that that quote is a good indication of what they really believe versus when they say, oh, test optional, we don't, you know, we have, you have just as good of a shot as a student who submits to school. I think that kind of defies common sense and logic as when you see a quotation like that. Um, now, that, that doesn't mean everybody in the world should test because if you can't get scores that are going to be, again, within like the range I mentioned for a school, then uh, submitting a score that's well below what a, what a, uh, you know, what their student body has, it's not going to help you get in either. So as far as when should I send a score? And that's a question I get so often from parents. It's saying, well, if I get to this school, it even help me. Um, and a good way to sort of look at a number on that to give you an objective answer is uh, I went to a presentation at, and uh, the director of admissions from Stanford University was there. I asked him very pointedly, uh, and he was there in, a, in not as a Stanford representative, but as a representative of, uh, of American selective school general, like let's call them like kind of top 50 schools. And he said, when you're thinking about submitting a test score to a school, if you go online and you find, uh, you can find this information for any university, they give the 25th and 75th percentiles of their admitted students in terms of their test scores. And anything above the 25th percentile 
is worth sending to the school because it shows the school that you are at least in the middle of the kind of student that they admitted the previous year, something above the 25th percentile. And I can go a little bit, if anybody has more specific questions about that vocabulary, about percentiles and everything, I'm happy to go into that uh, at, at the end of today's uh, you know, presentation. Uh, as far as accommodations go, I'm not going to go through each of the bullet points about accommodation available, but the most common one is 50% extended time. And so if you have a time for tests at your school, at your high school, you can usually get it uh, for these tests, for the SAT and the ACT. I want to focus a little bit more on the how to apply for accommodations, which is first start early. Accommodations, paperwork involved. And the paperwork sometimes needs to be edited or adjusted. You need to get another page from you know, a, a professional or you need to show a little bit more that you've gotten a little bit more support in the school than you have as a student. So the accommodations process, you know, it can take a week, it can take three months. So you generally want to start early. I usually say, you know, the fall of sophomore year, if you can, you know, try to start that process of applying for accommodations for standardized testing. Even if you're not going to take a test until junior year winter, just start the process early because once you get it, you have it for the rest of high school. So you might as well start early in case it ends up taking some time. Um, apply for both tests. You don't know in the end which one you're going to want to take. And you may think you're taking the SAT and you get into the preparation and find it's not the test for you. So apply for both exams from the beginning. It's almost all the same paperwork. So you might as well. Um, you can apply with guidance from your school's counseling team. They do it every year and they help parents every single year. So they've usually got it down to, to a science about here are the steps you need. Here's the paperwork you need. Um, when in doubt, ask your student's counselor at school. If you have accommodations at school, you, you already know them. And so it's the same person generally. Um, you want to have you have your ed psych testing, um, uh, an IEP at school, an ILP, a 504. Um, the school documentation, it needs to be accessible. It needs to be up to date. So all of those are, are the types of, of documents that, that sort of go into applying for accommodations. Uh, as far as extra time, as I mentioned before, ACT is likely the better exam. And I'm just you're talking about that from 20 years of experience. My students who had extended time and took the ACT are the ones of all of my students who got the largest score gains and also the largest outside of testing game, let's call it. They're the ones who really grew as students the most. And so for me, it's been the most rewarding programs and I think for my students as well. So if you're a student and you're willing to work hard and you get extended time for the ACT and the SAT, my recommendation is generally gonna to be to take the ACT and to have that be your plan. Um, uh, students often with accommodations, they often will underperform in their first initial test, their diagnostic test, uh, because the, the things that are hard about a diagnostic test, which is you're not prepared, you don't know what's involved, you're not prepared for the amount of time that it takes to complete the test, all of those things are exacerbated for students with learning differences. So I think they often underperform in those first tests. But man, I, those are my favorite kids. They're my most determined warriors, and they've made some incredible the jumps in score, talking 10, 12, 13 points on the ACT because they were willing to work hard and learn those patterns. Um, but in the end, when you're choosing your test, something that I that I didn't mention on the other slide, you want to take you, you want to take a practice test in the SAT and the ACT. All of those student personality types, um, all of that is important. But you want to see as a test professional like me, I want to see the numbers of how a student did on their PSAT and how a student does on a practice ACT. So I can compare those numbers and inform you as a parent which one is comparatively higher and, and why I want to send a kid in that direction. Um, as far as prep options, um, you know, three main options. Think about it as being one-on-one -on -one with a tutor, which is the type of service my company provides. There are some great companies that provide small group tutoring. Capital Educators does a good group class um, at a lot of schools. And self-guided, there are more self-guided options now than ever before. Khan Academy is the main one, it's no cost and students can do it when they have time. Um, they are much better organized than online resources um, were in the past. And now that's SAT only, not ACT, but if your student is taking the SAT and whether because of cost or time or schedule that neither a private one-on-one -on -one tutor or a small group program is the best option for them, the self-guided Khan Academy program is a really excellent free resource 
So all of these three are are good options. And, you know, while we only do private one-on-one -on -one right now, um, a lot of, if you're a, a very highly motivated student who um, is willing to, to really focus and pay attention in a small group class, that can be a great option as well. And like I mentioned, self-guided is better than it ever has been in the past. So great for students who want to take advantage of that. As far as the fundamentals, I, I mean this a lot for students. A lot of parents come to me freshman or sophomore year and they say, you know, I can my kids start test prep now? And I, and I always say, no, you know, we shouldn't start test prep in freshman or sophomore year. What you can do is work on the fundamental things that will be important on the tests as a junior, you know, so what are, and then the parents say, okay, well, what are those fundamentals? What should I be working on with my student or encourage my student to study that will make them a stronger tester when it comes time? And the first priority is definitely math because math is the most content heavy subject for the ACT and the SAT. Uh, and where students often struggle is on, you know, whether subject, whether it's algebra one or geometry is kind of the furthest in their rear view near kind of what, two years ago, three years ago, Something like that's what they really struggle with on the test because it's some pretty specific content and material that they haven't looked at for, you know, 800 plus days. So the first priority is math. And I say continuity and spiraling, meaning spiraling, meaning going back to old material. So if you're a ninth grader, look back at what you learned in eighth grade and what you learned in seventh grade. If you're a 10th grader, look back at ninth and eighth and seventh grade and Khan Academy, which I mentioned before, free on ConAcademy.org is a really good place for math specifically as well, totally outside of the SAT. You say, I wanna review what I learned in eighth grade math. You can go to Khan Academy, eighth grade math, and you can do bullet points and really see the core skills and refresh yourself and, and get feedback from Khan Academy. It's a good program. So that would be my first priority for a student. Reading would be my second priority, working on their vocabulary. Um, I, I mentioned learning those Latin and Greek roots in the test prep program junior year, I don't think is the best kind of yield for your time, but building your vocabulary as a freshman and a sophomore, it's good for the test, but of course it's also just good uh, as a human being and to be an interesting person to build your vocabulary. And so ninth and 10th grade, I think is a great time to do that. Learning varied prose, learning, I mentioned there's a lot of different topics on the SAT. The ACT has four different topics. Uh, in the reading section. So being able to read fiction versus nonfiction history versus nonfiction science and being able to read varied types of prose and be able to paraphrase and interpret in these different formats is what the SAT and ACT reading are all about. Um, and then evidence-based reading. And what that means is saying, answering a question, but being able to provide the precise reason why. So being able to say, okay, I read these two paragraphs and the author thinks X. But you have to explain why the author thinks X. And I like the format to be able to say the, the fourth word in the second sentence of the paragraph proves what I just said, that my answer is correct. And it's that kind of objective answer to be able to pinpoint the proof within the text that these exams are trying to get students to do. They're not answering it because, oh, well, this just feels like the right answer. They're saying it's right because of this in this sentence. That is the precision that uh, is at the core of what evidence-based reading and writing, which is the title of the SAT's verbal section, is getting at. And the third priority here would be grammar. Um, getting back to those rules that you learn in third and fourth grade, and you know, quotation marks, commas, semicolons, uh, understanding subject-verb agreement, all of those things that, again, by 10th, 11th grade, you're kind of focused on, you know, you got bigger fish to fry, which is like the five paragraph method and conclusions and introductions. You're not thinking about, you know, hyphens as much. But those are things that come on this test and that's something good to sort of shore up in ninth and 10th grade. Um, and finally, kind of with persuasion, it's about being able to write with persuasion and how to use grammar to do so because the SAT and ACT are both testing you on that also. Uh, and finally, some, some strategy for neurodiverse students in terms of best practices for all standardized tests. This goes for SAT, ACT, SSAT, GRE, et cetera. On math science parts of the test, of any of these tests, um, they're usually not able, because they're testing a broad, broad area of content, three, four years of school content, they can't get very specific and arcane with the information they're testing. And therefore, the way they make hard questions is by making questions multi-step, three, four, five-step questions on fairly basic or fundamental material. So, of course, the big part of that problem 
It's not memorizing the material. It's learning how to break down a four-step question into kind of individual four, you know, four steps. And part of that is going sentence by sentence and not trying to rush it and take the whole problem on at once. Learn to read one sentence and do some math from one sentence, then begin again with the second sentence. And that idea of breaking it up takes discipline, which is why it's something we have to teach our students. Prioritizing intentional avoidance of careless errors. Avoiding careless errors doesn't mean be careful. It's got to be more than that. You have to know where you as a person make careless errors and avoid that advance. So for instance, a lot of students don't read the last five words of a question carefully enough. They do all the math work correctly and they perfectly find what X equals. But the question said, what is Y? You know, that, and so they did all the math right, but they just didn't read the end of the question carefully enough. So intentionally avoiding careless errors is so important for the math. Um, and because we're at the end of my hour here, I kind of bunch reading and writing together the two verbal sections because a lot of it is the same, sort of the same core message I have for my neurodiverse students, which is that um, if you, the, the harder task is finding the right answer. Never start with the hardest task, start with the easiest task which is in reading and writing questions, start by getting rid of the worst answers. What that does is it now limits the amount of information and data that your brain is processing in the final step to find the best answer. Never find the best of four answers. Always get rid of the worst two answers. And then looking at the two that remain, you find the better of those two, because that's a much easier task that you're asking your brain to perform for you than looking at four answers and 30 words and trying to say which one of these is the best of the four. It's a much more difficult task. Seems like the same thing, but it's very different when you go through the process. So that's really the core message I have for my students is really start from bottom up when you're talking about the verbal, any kind of a verbal question on any of these exams. And that's it sort of for today's core presentation. In a, and now I wanna to really get to some of these questions. I know I covered a lot sort of kind of within that hour and I'm sure we'll have some uh, some questions and Brian's going to try to give us the the broadest ones first but uh, I promise in in this half an hour I'll be able to get to all the questions that were asked well thank you guys for joining please keep putting questions in in the chat we are happy to stay and answer every single last question we'll start off with a question from Lath who asks what if your child does well in quizzes but terrible in finals is not organized and does not study? Should they take the ACT? Um, I would say that that sounds a little bit more to me like an SAT student. Um, the, the difficulty in sort of studying and preparation and maybe some of the anxiety that comes with having for a final test to really retain a lot of information. To me, a lot of those are core ACT things. Uh, and so if those are all struggles, the SAT might be the better, you know, better the option, especially and if the student is hesitant to do study in time and, and prepare a lot, the ACT is generally a better test for harder workers. The SAT, you might be able to get some good gains, get away with a little bit more, it, you know, if you can, if you have some good intuition for the exams. Um, but, but ultimately for that student, I would also advise, as for all students, make sure they've taken an SAT or PSAT. Uh, and taking a practice ACT and compare the the two scores to see which one is stronger and use that as part of your decision making process. And that's something we're happy for anyone on the call. We offer free monthly in person practice diagnostic SAT and ACT exams in Falls Church, and we'll we'll put some information about that in the chat. But the first step is often just getting a diagnostic score. If your student's taken the PSAT, for example, then getting a diagnostic ACT and comparing those two. And that's something uh, we're happy to help anyone, any family on this call with. Uh, it looks like Keeley, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, asked if you can repeat the part about the scrap paper policy for where you write down problems for math. And I, I hope I'm getting that question correct. And if you need clarification, if you could... Uh, come off mute and just clarify or expand on that question, that would be helpful. Sure. And so you're going to have scrap paper for the math section. And so what will happen is, you know, you'll get the question on the screen. And so they, um, whereas on the paper test, most, let's say, geometry questions, often there was a figure provided for you on the paper test. And you would, you know, do draw on the triangle. You would mark sides that are equal. You would write in angles, things like that fairly intuitively. But now... With the digital test, uh, often 
they'll describe a figure you know in the problems they might say triangle abc has angle a 35 degrees and angle base angle b 62 degrees and then you as a student are responsible on your scrap paper for drawing the triangle and taking all the data from the word problem and putting it in, into your figure on the paper which as you might imagine especially for some of my di neurodiverse students there's a little bit higher probability for error there than when it was all already done for you in the figure picture on the paper test. But even non-geometry things, just uh, verbal questions, just if you read a question that says, Kara drove for three hours at 20 miles an hour. Um, as you want to write down that data, just from your eyes on the screen to going writing that on the paper, you can imagine a number of my students will read three, uh, two hours at 30 miles an hour and might maybe they'll write two, you know, two hours at 30 miles, like it just, you know, uh, just to mix up the numbers because their eyes left it to write it on the paper. Just those little differences um, can, you know, can sometimes hurt my students, uh, all students really, but my neurodiverse students a little bit more so. So that's what I mean about being, yeah, it's an extra thing you have to be careful for when you take a digital test, uh, especially in the math. And then a couple of questions here from Rami. I heard that there is a time limit to use the scores of the SAT and ACT. Is that true? And can you just speak to how long scores last uh, and what sort of time limit there is to use the scores? It would be very unusual to have to have a score, you know, no longer be good for for college. And even you know, if you the, the SAT, they did some schools did start becoming a little bit more strict about how early you can take the test. Um, you know, rarely is a student going to so good at the test, to take the test in, you know, in eighth grade and get a score that they're going to want to use when they apply to school's junior year. So, um, you know, if you're taking the test anywhere from late sophomore year on, you should be safe. If you're taking the test earlier than that, you might just want to look at some of the schools that you're planning to apply to and ask the question specifically to the admissions, because also it may be true that 90% of schools or 95% of schools will accept any scores that you do in high school, but the one school your student falls in love with, they have a different policy and they don't want any scores that are before, you know, before sophomore January, something like that. So if you're going to take it earlier than spring of sophomore year, just check the schools that you're most interested in. It probably won't be a problem if it's sophomore year or end of freshman year. But if it's before that, check your schools because that, that would be only a school specific thing. There's not a blanket policy for all universities. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, let me jump up to a question from Cece here, which is getting into the specifics of the digital SAT. Can you clarify the second section of the SAT based on their performance on the first set? How can they compare scores from the easier set of questions versus the more difficult set of questions and just talk a little bit more about the section adaptive nature of the digital SAT? I'm going to give you the simple and then the complex answer. The simple answer is that when you move on from that first section and you go into, let's say, the, the easier module, okay, and you have 25 questions on, the, on that new easier module, uh, you know, if you get three of those wrong, you get a certain score. If you get four of those wrong, you get a certain score. Or five of those wrong, you get a certain score. If you go to the, and so everybody from that easier module, which will be about half of the nation. Half of the kids will take the easier module, half of the kids will take that harder module. So the half of the nation that takes that easier module will have kind of a different score range. And based on the number of questions you get right on that easy module, you'll be in that score range. And then the same with, with the harder uh, module. And the difference will be, and you're asking how do the easy versus hard get compared, and it'll be that if you go to the harder module, let's say your math score will be somewhere between a 600 and an 800. Whereas if you go to the easier module, maybe your score is somewhere between a 450, you know, and a 650. So it's just that the that the two ranges are going to be different. And then how you do within that section tells you where you are in that range. So I hope that that's somewhat of a simple answer. The complex answer is that with um, with the new adaptive test, what they're able to do is to use a type of scoring that's very, very advanced, which actually... Um, you get graded not as simply as in the paper SAT. Each question has a different point value in a sense. And so you actually, you could miss 
the same number of questions as another student on the same two modules, but actually get a different score based on which questions you missed. It's quite a complex process. Um, whoever wants to say at the very end and hear more about it, I'm happy to do that. But what it means is just that the scoring of the test is going to be more opaque in this new digital SAT, more complicated, harder to understand as a parent, frankly. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a little bit less transparent, I'm afraid, um, because it's more complex. But in theory, it is also giving you a more accurate score to your skill set. To give you one tiny example of what it means to have different, you know, different values for each question, uh, uh, one question versus another one question might be easier to guess. So let's say you have a math question and as a student, you might have no idea how to find the real answer. But if two of the answers are negative, let's say and two answers are positive, and if, if it's fairly easy to make at least the guess that, oh, well, I think it's gotta be positive, And now you have a 50-50 chance, that would be a question that the SAT sort of the algorithm might say, oh, it's kind of easier to guess this one correctly. Whereas another question, where you absolutely have to know the math to get to the final answer, that's much harder to guess for. So in theory, that's a harder question. Fewer questions, students are gonna get that question right because it's harder to guess for. And so therefore it's a more valuable question in terms of how good you are at high school math. And so that's gonna be weighted a little bit more heavily. And I'm sorry, it's it's a very complicated uh, uh, process, but I hope that that gives you kind of one example of how one question can be worth more than another. And that, that's the direction that they're going um, in, in in this adaptive testing. I think just one final question. If you have any other questions, please please put them in the chat. But Lath asked, for accommodations, how recent does the EdPsych eval need to be? Um, so the that's for the SAT and the ACT. Um, it's going to be different for the two tests. And and frankly, the um, I've uh, the last time that I spoke with an ACT accommodation specialist, it wasn't uh, it wasn't so much like you have to have it like by this date. It, and it it depends also on the type of uh, accommodation that you're looking for, and also the diagnosis. So. For instance, and that's why I can't give you a blanket exact answer, because if the diagnosis is for something that's concussion related, of course, then that uh, you're going to need something fairly recent in terms of that shows that that concussion is it requires some intervention in school and on diagnostic tests um, as well. If it's something if it's a diagnosis of something that tends to wear off, you know, if it's something that tends to be self-corrected with age, there's something fairly recent to show that it's still an issue. Whereas if it's a diagnosis for something that's clearly going to be a lifelong condition, then that's something where the, the expiration date is going to be longer because it's not something that would have just gone away since you had that diagnosis four years ago. So I'm afraid I can't give you the exact answer for that. Um, and that's that's exactly one of the reasons why I say start early, because if you start in fall of sophomore year and based on the uh, accommodations you're looking for, and the diagnosis you have, they say we need something more recent. Well, you have plenty of time to get on somebody's schedule, which I don't know if you all know. Um, these doctors, the ed psych doctors are booked out very far in advance right now. And so that's one of the things you want to have time to get ahead of. Then one more question just came through. Uh, is the ACT also digital? And if you could just speak to that again about how it is, but we would not advise students to take it on the computer typically. Correct. So starting with the December test, the ACT said, we're going to start offering digital uh, examinations and you can sign up for that. Uh, but it's different from the SAT digital version in that uh, the SAT digital test has some changes that are going to benefit students. Um, in the changes in the format and the question types, the ACT digital version, it's the exact same test. It's simply a difference in medium, the difference of seeing it on a screen versus seeing it on paper. And for the reasons I mentioned before, almost all students um, in theory with any preparation should do better on paper than having to do things on the screen and transcribe them. Perhaps there are a few students out there who love screens, abhor paper, and just the the process of seeing it on a screen psychologically is more comfortable for them. That could be a scenario or a situation in which you might take a digital ACT, but we have not currently had any students in my memory that I would suggest doing a digital ACT over paper ACT. So I think that's going to be for a very few select students for whom that's an option you want to take advantage of. 
that is it for questions. If you guys, we were blocked off until nine. So if you have an individual question that you want to come off mute and ask Alex, we're happy to stay around and answer that question. If not, please feel free to reach out advisor at topscoreedu.com. We've put that in the chat a couple of times, advisor at topscoreedu.com. Happy to answer any specific questions that didn't make sense to uh to, to ask within the whole group context and just thank you to Pam and Kathy and Chad of Northern Virginia. We appreciate you guys, appreciate you guys hosting us. Well, we thank both of you very much for coming and helping us understand this. It's, you know, it's a perplexing process to look at being the first in any change. So thank you very much for your help. And as Brian has said, if anybody has a question, stay on. Otherwise, Thank you, and we will see you again next month. Thanks, everybody.